Welcome to Conversations. I'm Muqtada Khan, your host. And today I'm going to talk to you about how the real Game of Thrones is played in world politics. Today I'm going to talk about how countries seek to dominate their region, their area, their hemisphere, and even talk about how some countries may have aspirations for global domination. So broadly, this is an exercise in looking at the grand strategies of major powers. Uh, but I'm going to take a look at it uh, from a regional perspective. So we are living in an era where there is tremendous turmoil in international politics. Uh, the balances of power are shifting. Uh, uh, many people feel that America is on the decline and may not be able to sustain its hegemony as it did for the, for the past 60, 70 years. And so it is an opportunity for other powers to restructure global politics, uh, claim their own areas of spheres. And you can see that the war between Russia and Ukraine is an attempt by one of the powers to either expand or defend its perceived uh, sphere of influence. So I'm going to talk to you about how some countries are seeking to dominate the world or regional politics. But before I do that and start playing the real Game of Thrones, please subscribe to Conversations, ring the bell icon, like the video, and don't forget to share it with your friends, with your social political network, with your students and your colleagues. So let's begin. According to some realist thinkers, and if you want to understand what realism is, I actually have a conversation about the realist paradigms and all the theories uh, that use the philosophical assumptions of realism. And I will post a link to that in the video below so you can go back and uh, review what realism is. So some realist thinkers, uh, especially somebody like Professor John Mearsheimer of the University of Chicago argue that there are four potential grand strategies that a country can pursue. And they, uh, the whole spectrum is from isolationism to global domination. So the four strategies are isolationism, selective engagement, offshore balancing and global domination. Isolationism really means that you do not engage with the world. You try to stay as far away from the rest of the world as possible as the United States did between the two world wars. Uh, America's isolationism from 1919 till 1939 is often considered as one of the reasons why the League of Nations failed and perhaps Germany was able to rise and start World War II. Uh, so, so isolationism is considered as staying away from the rest of the, uh, the field. Uh, there are some countries today which are more or less isolated uh, uh, either through external influences such as North Korea or by choice such as Algeria, which seems to be practicing uh, more or less as an isolationist foreign policy, even though it does engage with its neighbors uh, with whom it has territorial issues. Uh, the second strategy would be that more or less remain isolated, do not engage the whole world, but on selective key issues to engage. So if you care about the environment, engage the world in combating in the environment. If you want to protect yourself from pandemics, then engage the world only on the issue of combating pandemics. Or if you are interested in the in some certain kind of say maritime security that engage in that aspect, or if you're interested only in protecting Europe and uh, forget about Africa and other parts of the world, then yes, put all your money in protecting Europe, protecting Europe's democracy, protecting uh, Europe's human rights while neglecting that in the rest of the world. So that would be selective engagement. The message is very clear. We care only about this part of the world. So we'll put all our eggs in this basket. We don't care about the other parts. Uh, that could be a very prudent strategy for uh, mid-level powers, but nations which uh, seek uh, global influence as well as seek to promote their values globally and seem to have a normative agenda to, to shape the structure of the world in a particular way, they really can't adopt a selective engagement process uh, or a selective engagement strategy. The fourth option is global domination. You care about everything. You want to dominate every part of the world. Uh, uh, and so you're involved in everything. You're involved in Europe, in Africa, in East Asia, South Asia, Latin America, Atlantic, and you worry about the space also. So that's global domination. You want to be the most important 
player in every sphere of world politics. That is not easy to do. It's very expensive. You may have to sacrifice a lot of your own citizens in trying to pursue global domination. And then it's quite possible that some spheres may not be worth dying for or spending uh, blood and treasure for. So, so global domination is, is not a policy that any wise or thinking uh, international strategies would recommend. It sounds more or less a waste of, of uh, resources, but you could argue that during the Cold War, both the Soviet Union and the West, the collective West, not just the US, but NATO, were seeking some kind of global ideological domination. The third strategy, which most people recommend, so I've talked to you about one, two, and four. The third strategy that most uh, realist uh, like to recommend is offshore balancing. What offshore balancing really means is that you make sure that you are safe and secure in your own region, in your own hemisphere. You're the dominant, most powerful player in your region. And then look at the world divided into separate regions and then selectively choose to dominate certain regions or more importantly, ensure that in no other region there is a regional hegemon. So for example, let us say that you want, you are the United States and you dominate the Western hemisphere. And then you look at Europe and then say, okay, who seeks to dominate Europe? England, France, and Germany. So you say, you make sure that none of the three dominates Europe. If Germany becomes very powerful, you balance Germany by supporting France or Britain. And if Britain becomes powerful, you support the next challenger and ensure that you don't spend a lot of resources to dominate that uh, region, Europe, but you also make sure that nobody else emerges as a regional or dominant player. So this is what offshore balancing really is. You dominate your region and ensure that no one has a region of their own to dominate, uh, and no one also dominates in other regions. Now let's talk about the, the game of global domination. I divide the world, like many other scholars, uh, also of this genre into eight regions, the Western Hemisphere. I divide Europe into two parts, that which is part of NATO and that which is the Eastern part of Europe, which is not part of NATO, such as Belarus. Uh, and then there is Central Asia. You could call the Eastern non-NATO Europe somewhat uh, part of it is Eurasia for sure. And then you have Central Asia. Uh, then you have Africa, South Asia, Middle East, and East Asia. So if you look at the color coding, uh, the, the blue that you see uh, is the US. Yellow is Russia. And dark red is China. So I'm looking at the influence of these five, uh, these three major powers. It is very clear that the United States is a dominant player in its own region, the Western Hemisphere. Since the Monroe Doctrine, the US has aspired to dominate the region. And you can say clearly that even though there's a lot of Chinese investment in Latin America, some people insist that I should pronounce Argentina as Argentina. Uh, it is very clear to say that the United States really dominates the security environment in the Western Hemisphere and is uh, quite clearly hegemonic. Uh, there is no other power in that region that can challenge the United States domination. So the US dominates its own neighborhood, the Western Hemisphere. It also more or less with NATO partners dominates Western Europe. So these two uh, bookends of the Atlantic Ocean are under US domination. These are also tremendously rich and powerful uh, between Europe and, uh, the, uh, and the Western Hemisphere. You could argue uh, that this is more or less more than 50% of the global GDP. Uh, and so the United States really controls half the world's economy just by controlling the Western Hemisphere and having a really overwhelming influence uh, on the Western Europe. On the Eastern Europe side, uh, which is shrinking rapidly and probably the reason why uh, Russia feels threatened by the expansion of NATO is the non-NATO Eastern Europe. I can right now only think 
primarily of Belarus, which is under the influence of Russia. So Russia basically dominates one and a half region. It dominates Central Asia, more or less, even though Kazakhstan is these days trying to escape uh, the regional domination of Russia. It is talking about uh, a multi-vector foreign policy, basically very similar to India's uh, uh, multi-alignment foreign policy. It wants to engage with the West uh, and is also trying to become a better democracy. So while Kazakhstan is trying to get out of the domination of Russia, you could still argue that part of the Caucasus, part of Central Asia uh, and Eastern uh, non-NATO Europe uh, is under Russian domination. So now you have basically four regions which are which Russia and the United States and its allies have divided among themselves. Now, if you look at Africa, the United States has not shown much interest in Africa, even though we just had the Africa summit and the United States has promised to invest over $50 billion in Africa. But if you talk to African leaders, you would realize that uh, the United States is not really as committed to Africa as it, it is to other parts of the world and certainly as it is to Europe. Uh, so I put it as red, light red, because I think among these three superpowers, the, uh, the superpower which has the greatest in influence in Africa is China. And not only that, China's, I think, first overseas major uh, military base is, is in Africa. It has a lot of influence on African countries. It invests heavily there. So you could say that it's not fully under Chinese domination, but it is somewhat becoming pinkish. The only real challenger uh, to Africa, uh, to Chinese domination in Africa, is I think to some extent India, which is seeking to become the voice of the global south. Uh, and one of, in its grand strategy, uh, India has an Africa focus. So India is seeking to invest in Africa uh, financially, intellectually, culturally. So I think uh, it is quite possible that in a couple of decades you will see. Uh, competition between China and India uh, for domination in Africa unless a major power emerges in Africa itself. So if you look at it uh, that uh, so far uh, there is no, uh, I don't think there is any African power that can dominate Africa. Let's skip South Asia, I'll get back to it in a moment. Let's talk about the Middle East. The Middle East was also another region where the U.S. has dominated for decades. Uh, so if I was drawing this, uh, this diagram, say, 10 years ago, then the Middle East would be as dark blue as you see Europe and Western Hemisphere. But the United States allegedly is withdrawing from the Middle East, gradually showing less interest in the Middle East every time. Uh, our presidents go there, they are either trying to advance self-interest, as in case of Donald Trump, or the interest of Israel, as in case of Biden. The only time he went to the Middle East, apparently it was only to get uh, Israeli commercial uh, flight access over Saudi Arabia. Nothing for America. That was nothing there on his agenda for the trip. Uh, and the U.S. Is apparently seems to be less committed, either allowing Iran to expand its influence in the region, or now with the Iran uh, and Saudi deal, you can see that China is also beginning to challenge uh, and compete for hegemonic influence in the Middle East. So right now, while the US does dominate it, it is not as dominant as it was in the past, it's creating a vacuum. And I think that uh, uh, mostly China to a great extent, and then to a little extent, Russia and India will also seek uh, to expand influence in the Middle East. So if you're going to see great power rivalry, you probably might see uh, a continuously receding a United States uh, and the ascendance of non-Western powers like Russia, uh, India, and China, uh, with China on top competing for domination in the Middle East. It is also quite possible that if Iran can uh, find some way to get out of the sanctions, it is quite capable of becoming a significantly important and powerful regional player in the Middle East. Uh, now coming to South Asia, South Asia is an interesting uh, region. It is a region which is completely contested 
you can't say that there is any major power that is dominating South Asia. Uh, by rights, this region should belong to India, and I should have called it the Indian subcontinent and not South Asia. But the military strength that the United States has given to Pakistan and the fact that Pakistan has nuclear deterrence uh, and is unwilling to cooperate with, the, with India and is constantly challenging India uh, for, for regional, at least preventing India from becoming a dominant player in South Asia. On top of that, we see incursions from China. So you could argue that while India is a very important and critical player in South Asia, India has not achieved the kind of domination India seeks uh, uh, like, like the U.S. has in Western Hemisphere or, or Russia has in, in Central Asia. India does not have that kind of uh, influence in South Asia. In fact, one could argue that India probably has more influence in Central Asia than it has in South Asia. Uh, and now coming to East Asia, East Asia is the region that China really wants to dominate. It is its home ground. But unfortunately, there are many, many players there which are resisting China's hegemony in the region. China is undoubtedly the most powerful player in East Asia, but Japan is challenging it, Taiwan is challenging it. Uh, and uh, while South Korea is not as belligerently anti-China as Japan and Taiwan are, well, Taiwan is not that anti-China, it's just afraid of China and is arming itself and aligning with the West uh, to, to somehow sustain its independence from China. But Japan and Australia definitely are seeking to ensure that the China does not dominate East Asia. And the U.S. is also, through its Quad and through its Indo-Pacific strategy, is trying to make sure that China does not fully dominate East Asia the way the U.S. dominates Western Hemisphere. If China becomes dominant in East Asia, then it, it's like saying you ensure that your fort, your neighborhood is secure and only you and you only are the major power in that region. You make the rules, you police the region, if, you, if China can achieve that in East Asia, then it can start competing with the U.S. Uh, in other parts of the world. But China is already uh, making incursions in the Middle East and Western Hemisphere. Uh, most uh, people who talk about offshore balancing will say that first make sure that you, your home is protected uh, before you venture out uh, on adventures in far off regions. So this is how the world looks to me today that the US uh, dominates two of the most important regions in the world uh, from Canada all the way down and Western Europe. Uh, uh, Russia more or less dominates uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. China is seeking to establish hegemony in East Asia and is making incursions in Africa to some extent in Middle East and economically in Latin America. And of course, is, is uh, pushing India in South Asia. We saw that in 2020, we saw that again in 2022. So these are the three major players and the way they are playing. There are regional players uh, like Iran, uh, India to some extent, Brazil, South Africa. They are also part of BRIC countries except for Iran and Turkey. But none of them have achieved the kind of domination in their regions that you need in order to become a, a major player. So this is my assessment of the game of global domination. This is the scorecard. You could say this is the first quarter. Uh, at least this is the first time I'm making such a, a net assessment. So we will look at this again in three to four months. We are living in an era of very rapid change. Uh, perhaps what happens in, in the Russia-Ukraine war may suggest that either Russia will expand, keeping a lot of Ukrainian territory, or Russia might recede and maybe even concede territory to Ukraine. It might go back to before 2014. We don't know what happens. So in three to four months, I will take a second look at this game of global domination. I hope you find it interesting. If nothing, it, uh, it should uh, stimulate those of you who are interested in geopolitics, foreign policy, and grand strategy. Uh, this is Muhtadar Khan. Uh, and so please make sure that before you leave, you subscribe to Conversations, ring the bell icon, 
like the video and make sure you share it with your friends, your social network. If you're a professor with your students, and if you're using this in your class to trigger the discussions, uh, do let me know. So, so that would be very nice. This is Muqtadar Khan. Take care for now. Bye.